College of Law. My name is Milena Serio, and I'm a professor and associate dean here at the College of Law. Our dean, Lee Fisher, equally welcomes all of you, but because of a family emergency, he unfortunately could not be here um, today. But we have a wonderful program on the nuts and bolts of Ohio campaign finance, and we were very pleased to have partnered with the League of Women Voters and the Cleveland Metro Bar Association for um, this program. So there are two sessions in the program. Session one will focus on um, the Ohio laws, Ohio campaign spending and finance laws, and then the second session will focus on looking at alternative campaign finding, funding models used in other um, United States, um, you know, states and communities. Each program will run for about an hour or, you know, sort of 55 to 60 minutes, and we'll have a short break between the two programs. We have coffee and refreshment, so um, if you'd like to grab a cup or a, a granola bar, please um, help yourselves. The first program, session one, we have two speakers. We have Don Bry, and then um, instead of um, Don McTighe, we have Corey Columba, who's a partner at the McTighe and Columba law firm in Columbus, and, and, and Don McTighe, unfortunately, could not be here because of a, essentially pressing work matters, but we have a, an equally um, competent and qualified speaker. And then the second um, session, we will have two additional speakers, Catherine Turser and Sandra Miller-Cole, um, and we will um, introduce them more formally at the beginning of the second session. The format of each session will be that each of the speakers will speak for about 15 minutes, um, and then we will have plenty of time for your questions. So without further ado, um, Donald Bry. Uh, good morning. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to give a brief uh, lightning history of campaign finance in the United States from, well, I don't know, 1757 on. And then Cora Colombo is going to follow up with some of the nuts and bolts of it, and hopefully we'll have some Q&A. And don't feel bad about having Cora instead of Don. Uh, the last lawsuit we had adverse to each other, he beat me soundly, and I'm still smarting. <laughs> um, the law has uh, often been in defined as an ordering of reason promulgated by one in authority for the common good, which is to say it's an, is or human law should be an ordering of reason rather than an ordering of passion, an ordering of, of race or class, an ordering of will, an order, ordering of passions. But human nature being what it is, it's, it's not unusual for in the guise of what is in the common good people to find the common good advanced by their own political interest in the area of campaign finance. And that's been true for a long time. Even as early as 1757 with the father of our country, George Washington, who in his first campaign for the Virginia House of Burgesses uh, did what politicians do. He had he wasn't going to give people money to vote for him. After all, there were a huge number, 391 people who were white male property owners who were allowed to vote for him. And they put on parties. So he spent 39 pounds to buy 160 gallons of, of rum and other alcoholic beverages, which amounted to about one quart per voter, and, and was elected. And Later on, that year or the next one, the Virginia House of Burgess has decided because of their uh, virtuous tendencies to ban the offering of not just money, but any gift, uh, reward, entertainment, food, or drink. So uh, we've had virtue in our country ever since then. The campaign finance issues, though, I mean, this was really not so much to avoid corrupting the candidate as opposed to trying to buy votes in, in, in subverting the system. There wasn't a lot of election contests the way we think of them now because it was mostly an upper class uh, voter, weren't a lot of contested candidates and, and, and it, it developed over time. It may be that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution had implicit within them certain notions that, that later became more prominent of, of, of uh, the democratic principle, but it was designed on a Republican principle, which is, is separation of powers. So you have a, the demos, the, the, the democratic institution of the House, the aristocratic institution of the Senate, which originally was until the early 20th century, was appointed by state legislators, not 
elected directly by voters, and of course the presidency, which, which uh, had the executive function. They were all familiar with Blackstone's commentaries, which described the similar three principles of the three types of government as, as president of the British system, and, and uh, our forefathers thought they had improved that, and hopefully they were right. We'll see. You know, it's been a good run. Um, <laughs> But in the meantime, in the, in the early 1800s, the property requirement was, was, was loosened up in most states so that you didn't have to own property to vote, you still be white male. And you didn't have to, and you had more people, you had more growth and more industry. So by, or not more industry, but more people who were qualified to vote through immigration and through expanding the franchise. So in 1828, you had the Martin Van Buren, a New York banker who engineered the Jackson campaign with many of the things we now associate with a campaign, newspapers, pamphlets, rallies, candidate uh, travel, which had, had not been used before. And uh, you know, it was used successfully by him, and, and he really is one of the authors of the modern Democratic Party. Uh, they claim Jefferson too, but who knows. The, uh, it was still financed by a small number of will-heeled people. In other words, you didn't have a broad base of financial support. You had a few people who were very interested in the process uh, enough to make a, a significant a financial uh, investment, I suppose. But by the 1830s, Jackson also invented a new notion uh, which became prominent in both parties. It's called the spoil system. Since most of the employees of the federal government and both state governments were there at the sufferance of their elected appointed authority, it made perfect sense to the 1800s mind to require them to pay, say, 2% of their salary to the candidate so that he could still be in office and you could still have your job. Um, you, you, you know, if you didn't do that, you might lose your job, probably would lose your job. And this seemed like a fine thing. Although the Democrats started it, the Republicans perfected it, and by 1878, 90% of Republican Congressional Committee income came from these assessments, you know, through the spoil system, which continued until 1881's assassination of President Garfield by a disgruntled office seeker. And um, this caught people's attention. So the Pendleton Act was, was uh, passed, which uh, more limited than the Hatch Act, which we'll talk later, but with the first notion that federal uh, employees cannot be solicited by other federal employees to, to give money for political purposes. And the purpose there, of course, was not to protect the candidate against being corrupted, but to protect federal employees from, from being um, encouraged to, at the cost of their job to, to provide. Having said that, um, even as late as the uh, 1980s, and I think it was the early 1990s if memory serves, that Ohio uh, banned the use of flower funds, which was common in Ohio state government where people were asked to voluntarily make contributions to, say for example, uh, Tony Celebrese as Attorney General's office it says uh, employees were asked to give his campaign fund, and that happened in other offices as well, um, until it became politically inexpedient. Um, and then, just as George Washington did, the people who found it politically expedient declared it to be a terrible thing and voted to get rid of it. Um, with the demise of the, of the uh, spoil system assessments, you also had, in, in the late you know, post-Civil War, 1870s to you know, 1900, the, the, the huge rise of corporations, the huge rise of industrialization in, in our country. And corporations became a, a significant source of campaign funds for both parties. And of course, the, the rise of labor also became a, a significant source of funds, uh, particularly for, for the, uh, the Democratic Party once they became legalized. Um, and it, it's, it's really sort of odd. If you look, for example, at the 1896 campaign between um, William McKinley and William Jennings Bryan. And, and there's a recent book about that, that, that uh, that's fascinating that you, uh, well, uh, well uh, I'm, I'm distracting. So Mark Hanna, another Ohioan, uh, c had a, a really ethical system. He said, I am going to hit up all the corporations who should have an interest in, in getting McKinley in, uh, elected and tell them how much they should pay. And I will not accept any more than that. McKinley will have nothing to do with soliciting this. 
and I will not accept any quid pro quo, any money with, with strings attached or promises. So he was very successful, and, and the corporations thought this was a fine idea. When people gave him more than, than Hannah assessed, he gave back to him. And um, this, this seemed like a great thing. And indeed, Teddy Roosevelt, now known as the trust-busting progressive of the Republican Party, plus he's in Mount Rushmore, um, in 1904, 73 percent of the Republicans' presidential funds came from corporations. And then in 1905, the state of New York did an investigation into Equitable Life Insurance Company and found that it had made large contributions to the Republican Party. Well, you know, everybody knew that. But then it got in the newspapers. And then everybody knew that. And Teddy Roosevelt was shocked, shocked, <laughs> that, that, that corporations were so actively involved in making political contributions. And so the Tillman Act was passed in 1907, banning corporate contributions by federal banks and corporations. It later got tightened up. Um, Tillman Act didn't really do much because you could still you know, use corporate money by having corporations pay their executives a bonus with strings attached, give this to this candidate, which is what they did. And none of this is reported, of course. Uh, plus, there was no enforcement mechanism. And uh, you know, water will find a way. Um, later on, they also passed a publicity act, which, which uh, required certain disclosures of, of contributions uh, in, in 1910, but it didn't really accomplish much either. And again, there was no enforcement mechanism that the Teapot Dome scandal, which was a straight up bribery scandal, um, also involved in their investigation discovered that one of the principals, Oilman Henry Sinclair, had made large but legal uh, campaign donations in off years to avoid any disclosure on, under the uh, you know, the, the 1910 Publicity Act, because that was only for campaign year contributions. And so they, they decided to close that loophole. And finally, um, FDR got elected. And Republicans and Southern Democrats saw FDR as possibly trying to entrench himself through you know, people who were not federal employees per se, but they were recipients of federal funds through the WPA and other things. So they, they did a couple things. First, in the Hatch Act, they uh, banned political contributions beyond uh, you know, federal government employees to be any government employee or a federal contractor or executives of state employees and executives of state agencies that were financed in the whole or part by the federal government. And they established the civil servants, so you have certain civil service protection um, in the federal government. Most states, including Ohio, adopted that in one fashion or other. Uh, the, the FDR folks also, you know, who were concerned about his power in 1943, passed the smith Conley Act, which prohibited unions from contributing to campaigns during World War II, which was made permanent in the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947. And Republicans had taken over Congress by 1947. Re, uh, unions gave to, to Democrats, so obviously the public good required the prevention of the source of funds for the other party. It didn't work that way. And, and it, uh, oddly enough, it, it didn't even work that way for, for the, for the corp corporate money because what happened was, uh, as, as one of the um, deals, as they were negotiating this back and forth, you, you, you know, the, the unions had been using PACs, even from, from, from the prior time. You, when, 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 and um, it wasn't set out in the law. So the law expressly set out in Taft-Hartley that unions could use PACs and also said that corporations could use PACs and the unions and the corporations became more involved in the political process and contributing through their PACs than they had been before. And uh, things went swimmingly along for the 46 years since uh, the Disclosure Act required disclosure. Nobody was ever successfully prosecuted. Um, and there wasn't much of a, uh, of a, uh, a mechanism for that until Nixon got elected. Uh, the Republicans, uh, didn't have the House, and I don't think they had the Senate, but the Reformed Democrats sort of came in in, in, uh, in 1970, usually, not always, but usually in the two-year mark, the other party, the out party, has, has a recovery in Congress. And that certainly happened in 1970. So they passed the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, which did some things and then added some teeth in 1974, uh, which required disclosure, limited both contributions and expenditures, and um, ultimately in Buckley versus Filet, William F. Buckley's brother won the Senate in, in New York State. Remember, this is a different time um, than, than today. 
And they're also, I think, a split in the Democratic Party, otherwise he wouldn't have stood a chance even then. But he didn't like the uh, notion that you could limit either contributions or expenditures in, in the FEC Act. And so he filed a lawsuit, went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court said contribution limits, you know, you, you know first of all, First Amendment, fundamental value, you, ha you have to have a, um, you know, a, a significant governmental interest uh, and you, you have to use the least restrictive means to achieve that interest, but the U.S. Supreme, you know, this is general law in terms of, of uh, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with a fundamental right such as free speech. And yes, money is speech. You know, if, if you think money is speech, remember the poem, Mother, may I go and swim? Yes, my darling daughter. Hang your clothes by yonder limb, but don't go near the water. If you don't have money, you can't talk. You know, and if you don't have water, you can't swim. Um, the Buckley v. Reese's Filet, the U.S. Supreme Court said, contribution limits are okay because you have a significant governmental interest in preventing the appearance of corruption and therefore limiting the amount that any one individual or contributor can, can give you will limit the amount of potential corruption or the appearance thereof. However, limiting the amount that you can spend is limiting speech and that's unconstitutional so they struck that down. And um, later on, you know, because you had soft money, you get out the vote, party stuff that was still un underreported and so forth. From, from uh, some points of view, the McCain-Feingold was passed, it was upheld, it was struck down, and ultimately in Citizens United, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court said, yes, corporations have a right to speech too if the, the corruption notion prevents them from giving direct contributions, but they can make independent con expenditures to speak. And here we were talking about a filmmaker, which was Citizens United, who had a film saying Hillary Clinton has, has done a lot of terrible things. Uh, who knew? But uh, he, he made a film about it. And um, it, was, it was published, you know, or was going to be published before the election, and, and the uh, McCain-Feingold would prohibit that. The U.S. Supreme Court said you can't do that because speech does, does include communications even by corporations, which where does this leave us? All of our attempts to regulate uh, money have been associated with, I can prove correlation, not causality, have been associated with increased money, increased time spending get, getting money, increased uh, involvement by corporations and labor unions or anybody else you think is evil, um, you know, other ways of finding this, increased in, in novel ways through 527s, through super PACs, through 501c4 charitable organizations don't report their contributions but funneling less than half of it to a super PAC that says we got it all from the C4. Um, you know, there are all sorts of ways that you, 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 the increased disclosure requirements mean there are increased efforts to find loopholes to disclosure requirements. And Corey Colombo and I are more than willing to help you find those loopholes and, and drive a truck through these regulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having us here. Again, my name's Corey Colombo. Um, my partner, Don McTigg, apologizes he couldn't be here, but he uh, sent a better, uh, younger, Better look. Uh, uh, but we, uh, we are both from law firms, uh, Don Bry and myself are both from law firms in Columbus. My particular, particular law firm specializes in election law, political law, campaign finance, uh, with four full time attorneys um, and three support staff that do nothing but campaign finance. So um, people are always amazed when I tell them what I do that there could be that much legal work, but it really has become a very specialized area. Um, it's a really good day to have the seminar. Today is the uh, filing deadline for the pre-general reports, which is one of the big, biggest filing deadlines of the year. This is a day where um, candidates pretty much show their cards to the public. Who has given us money? How have we spent the money that we've raised? And you can always anticipate a newspaper article tomorrow about uh, how much each candidate's raised and what does everything mean uh, by what was in their reports. Um, I also want to just quickly say it's just a privilege to present with Don Bry. Um, I, I, I always laugh. He naturally sits on the right. I guess I naturally sit on the left. But uh, um, very few people could give the history of this very complex area the way Don Bry has um, because he's lived through the battles and seen the laws changed and been a part of the court cases interpreting these laws. Um, not as far back as George Washington, but... Before my time. <laughs> Before, but uh, a lot longer than I have. Um, and I didn't know how many law students would be here, but 
uh, maybe un unbeknownst to Don, um, I always give the story to young law students that, you know, Don primarily represents Republicans. I primarily represent Democrats, but we are so professional with one another, and we, and we fight like heck when we have a court case or an election commission hearing. But at the end of the day, we walk to our cars together. We catch up on each other's families. Um, so um, there's just a few law students out there. And just, uh, just I know I'm digressing a little bit, but there's no reason um, in, in being a lawyer you can't also be professional in what we do. Um, and campaign finance really is a good thing for every attorney and every law student to have just the basic understandings of. You know, lawyers I've found are often asked to serve as the treasurers of these campaign committees. I think a good reason being is that the laws are very complex at certain points. There's a lot of regulations to sift through, a lot of compliance. Um, so I'm just curious, has anyone here ever served as a treasurer in the room? Wow. More than I would have thought. I mean, that's probably a third of the room. So um, additionally, a lot of lawyers law students will go on someday to be a candidate themselves and um, whether it be for a judge or board of elections or general assembly um, and you really as a candidate yourself need to know these laws because the headline in the newspaper is not going to be that your treasurer messed up a report it's going to be that you as a candidate can't competently run your own campaign how can you run for city council um, and you'll certainly, as lawyers, be asked to, to make contributions, and many in the room know, uh, I'm, I'm certain are familiar with that. Um, so with the presentation being nuts and bolts, and I only have 10 to 15 minutes, I really just want to give a, a, a good overview, and then maybe we can get to more specific questions. Um, but I encourage Don, jump in at any point you want. Um, just as a starting point, why do we even have campaign finance and laws? Well, Don gave you a good, pretty good history leading up to where we are now, but at the end of the day, it's all about disclosure, uh, having the electorate uh, be informed about how um, money is being raised and spent, uh, transparency, who are the contributors, it's accountability. Um, you're putting, pretty much putting your reports out to the public uh, to make sure you're running your a campaign within the confines of the law and that you're spending your money um, with the purpose to influence the results of the election is the big buzz phrase. So every expenditure that we look at or are asked to approve, we ultimately ask, is this purpose to influence the results of the election? Um, and then there's some other things that money can be used for. Charitable donations is allowed by the law or in the furtherance of the duties of your office. Um, but the contribution limits um, have evolved essentially to prevent corruption too. Um, and then campaign finance reports have taken on other importance in um, public discourse. Uh, certainly it's a show of uh, your level of support when those reports go out. You, you kind of see which candidates have the most support, uh, especially before a primary. Um, and I have no doubt, I was thinking on the drive here today, we have eight candidates right now in the ring for governor next year, and I have no doubt when the next campaign finance reports come out and someone sees that they raised four million and their opponent uh, raised 500,000, uh, people start talking about who's the stronger candidate. Um, but what, what entities would you deal with if you're involved in this area? Um, at the federal level, it's the Federal Election Commission, um, which is based in Washington, D.C. It has six commissioners no more than three from either uh, uh, from the same party. And they have a full staff that audits congressional and federal reports. They conduct hearings of alleged violations and they um, issue advisory opinions in a nutshell. Um, but then um, at the state level, um, the Secretary of State's office uh, is, is tasked uh, with the elections law. And John Husted, as m most of you should know, is a currently the Secretary of State. He's the state's chief election officer. Um, as Secretary of State, he um, issues directives to his, the boards of elections explaining uh, his interpretation of various laws. He also breaks tie votes when boards split their votes two to two. Um, he, uh, his office provides advice to candidates. Um, and then his staff also has a team of, of people that audit reports of uh, 
statewide office holders, statewide candidates, General Assembly candidates. Now under the, besides the Secretary of State's office, each county has their own board of election, as I'm sure many of you have dealt with. With, eight, with Ohio having 88 counties, there's 88 boards of election. And I'm just reminded all the time how these are 88, uh, now they all have to follow the, the structure of the Ohio law, but many of them have different procedures, regulations, how they like to do things. So if you're practicing in this area or involved as a treasurer, you really get, need to get to know uh, how your board operates. But the board itself is um, made up of two uh, members of the majority party, two members of the minority party, so Republican and Democrat, so it's balanced. And then there's a director and a deputy director, one of op each of opposite parties. Um, now, another difference is between Board of Elections is a county like Cuyahoga or Franklin have very um, uh, well-trained staff. People who have specialized in this area have very unique um, duties at the boards uh, and uh, just very large staffs uh, to handle very complex uh, issues. When you get into some of the smaller counties, some of them only have just the director and deputy director. That's the only staff they have. And uh, I won't name the county, but I dealt with one a few years ago that the deputy and, uh, and the director were both in their young 20s, were just kind of learning uh, election law themselves, uh, you know, just, uh, so you, you see both extremes. Um, and then the overarching uh, body that uh, Don and I both appear before regularly, the administrative agency, uh, agency is the Ohio Elections Commission. Uh, they have uh, seven members. Uh, generally, it's three Republicans, three Democrats, and one independent. Um, and they have an executive director who's an attorney himself with two staff members. And this, this body hears alleged campaign finance violations and issues advisory opinions on uh, interpreting Ohio law as well. So um, since this is kind of a nuts and bolts talk, um, I just want, if you happen to be thinking about running for office or thinking of, uh, or if you're asked to be a treasurer, where do you even begin? Um, and I, I always think back to my first day of Sib Pro when I was a law student. My law professor pulled out a Monopoly game and the instructions, and he said, you're going to make a living because you're going to be the one to read these things and explain to others what they mean. And that, that happened to be Brad Smith, who uh, went on to serve at the Federal Election Commission as the, uh, as the chairman. But it's the same thing for campaign finance. You really have to get a good handle on what laws apply to you, um, have a strategy for how you're going to manage the books. I mean, at the end of the day, campaign finance is basically like dealing with a, a family uh, checkbook or bank statement. It's money in, money out, parameters for each. What There's acceptable um, people you can accept money from, money you can't accept peop, uh, from people, um, dollar amounts from certain people. Um, same thing with expenses. There's proper ways to spend money and not proper ways. There's loans, there's debts, kind of like it would be for a family. So you're keeping, the, keeping track of those records uh, to give an accurate accounting. Um, the treasurer is ultimately the one who signs the report. Uh, they're, they're verifying under law that the statement's accurate. So you're gonna wanna pick a good treasurer as a candidate. Um, we deal with a lot of issues where treasurers get a little over their head because they thought they were helping out a friend and, and uh, had no idea they were engaging in such a complex endeavor. Um, so they, as a treasurer, you would have fiduciary duties. Um, and then other questions to ask right out of the gate, I mean, are we talking a federal, state, or local candidate? Because there's differences with each. Um, are you dealing with a candidate versus a political committee? Because there's differences there. Um, there's political action committees, which is essentially more than one person or entities pooling their resources uh, to impact elections uh, as, a, as a committee. Um, in Ohio, Title 35 is the main section that you'll keep going back to in this area. Um, also, if you're starting out in this area, a good place to start is 
several boards have nice introductory packets that they give you, just kind of the, the, the things you need to know. Um, Ohio has a really good, the Secretary of State's office has a um, campaign finance handbook, which pretty much answers 90, 95% of the questions I have when I forget something. Um, I don't know if they print this anymore or not. It might just be only online, but it's easier to search online anyway. Um, you know, in addition to the campaign finance handbook, Oh, and I should mention at the federal level, the federal level has their own equivalent of, of, a, of a campaign fi finance handbook. You know, the, the main questions you would have as a candidate or a treasurer. Um, another thing you're going to want to know right out of the gates in campaign finance is what are the limits? What are the contribution limits? And those change every couple years. They're adjusted for inflation, but both the federal and state level has contribution limit charts where you can line up based on who the individual is, I'm sorry, based to, on who the contributor is and who's the recipient, how much money can go each way uh, per election or per year. Um, another thing you're gonna wanna know right out of the way, and, and I'm just speaking from the, phone, the panicky phone calls we get, um, which people should look into right away, is what are the days of the year you're gonna have to file these reports? Um, because uh, some years, uh, interestingly enough, there's no reports required. If a candidate filed a post general after they ran, they might not have to file one for another year, year and two months. But some types of clients we have, um, such as federal independent expenditure uh, committees, have to file 24 and 48 hour reports in the days and weeks leading up to the election. So we're filing a report every day as required by federal law. But um, Generally, in the years a uh, candidate would run, you're going to have more reports, a pre-primary, a post-primary, a pre-general, post post-general. Um, and then, um, let's see. And then just know the quirks of the law. I mean, today with being a filing de day, a lot of, every year it happens, we have someone tripped up that they don't understand the, the, the cutoff point to file your report's four o'clock. So they drive over at 4.30 to file the report and the report's late. It's filed on the right day, but not before four. So there's a whole bunch of things like that. Um, some reports are required to be filed electronically. You know, there's things like that to get to know. Um, the other thing is, uh, let's see, I've got about, what, five more minutes? Okay. Um, some other practical things to know is the, the whole process starts up by filing that designation of treasure form with the uh, either Secretary of State's Office or Board of Elections or a statement of organization with the FEC. Now at the state level, you're not allowed to accept contributions until that committee is in place. So I've, I have had a, a year or two ago, I had a client who came in with a whole bunch of money and checks and said, I can't wait to get things rolling. I've already raised a ton of money. I said, well, what's your committee name? Oh, no, that's why I'm here to see you. I don't know what to do with all these checks. Um, that, that was a big no-no that uh, some were written out to him personally uh, and, uh, you know, just wads of cash. So uh, it's good to learn things uh, right from the start. Um, and it's hard to bounce back and forth between the state and federal differences, but one difference is on the federal level, you're allowed to start raising some money. Uh, testing the water uh, phase is what they call it. Uh, up to $5,000 before you have to file a report. Um, but I look at these campaign committees almost as small companies. Um, most of the times you're going to have to get a federal taxpayer ID number to get the bank account rolling. Um, some of the treasurers in the room will understand banks are so confused when you try to explain to them what you are because you don't fit neatly into their system. Um, I've had bankers call and yell at me thinking we were trying to, you know, create a fictitious organization because they can't find the entity anywhere on the Secretary of State's website. Well, it is there, it's just under campaign finance, not under business search. So you run into a lot of that kind of thing. Um, two important overlays that we like to talk about are, so you got federal, state, and um, uh, local, but um, for judicial candidates, uh, be aware that there's a whole set of other laws you have to comply with. And uh, that comes from uh, the uh, Supreme Court and the Code of Judicial Conduct. So there's a whole section there, um, specifically Rule 4.4, that are targeted towards judicial candidates. And that's 
Um, the gist of those are uh, because judges must have impartiality and then the judicial system must have integrity and that type of thing. But certain things like judges can't personally solicit contrib contributions unless it's an audience of 20 or more. Um, there's rules like that, so obviously in a room like this, if I were a judicial candidate, I could ask you for money. If a few of you left, I would be putting my candidacy in great danger. So uh, kind of an arbitrary rule. Judges can't accept personal, uh, personally accept the checks. Uh, they can't accept checks more than 120 days before the primary. Uh, just to give you some examples, and then judicial candidates have their own unique contribution limits that they must follow. Um, another important overlay to this whole campaign finance structure, uh, if you're representing a local candidate or a local candidate yourself, it's imperative that you look at your um, city or village's charter and, and, and ordinances. Um, the best example I can give is the city of Columbus, because uh, we have a lot of Columbus candidates um, in our office, and they have a whole another set of requirements that candidates have to file. Um, they have to file extra reports each year. They have to also file their reports electronically in addition to filing at the board. Um, the format for filing electronically is very specific because it has to sync up to their format. Um, and you have to list all employers or, and, and occupations of the contributors. So there's around the state, there's different municipalities that have different quirks with what you're required to do to comply with the local laws. Um, let's see, a couple more minutes. Uh, Mistakes happen in this because there's such a high volume of documents and dollar amounts. Um, most of the time, if a mistake happens, you can amend your report. It's no problem. Um, the board, uh, boards of elections and Secretary of State's office will send you an audit letter. will give you an opportunity to make corrections and fix things. Um, and then also, um, periodically, a, an improper contribution will slip by that you can refund um, or return. Uh, one example is there's, um, in Ohio law, you can't accept more than $100 in the cash contributions from a single individual. So periodically at a fundraiser, we'll hear the next day, yeah, they gave me $200 of cash. And we say, well, you have to give 100 back then. Um, uh, candidates in Ohio cannot accept corporate contributions. Sometimes those slip by and we ask them to return the check or make a refund. Um, candidates in Ohio cannot accept contributions from foreign nationals. If one of those slips by, you refund the check. Um, and if a mistake were to happen, uh, happen, it would, in Ohio here, go before the election commission. For minor things, you're pretty much going to get a slap on the wrist. They'll find a violation, but not impose a fine or refer it to prosecution. Um, of course, the worst part about that is after some of those hearings, the Opposition will naturally uh, issue a commercial or whatnot saying how this person's been found by the state of Ohio to be a violator of the law, you know, a week before the election. So that's almost the worst penalty. But, um, you know, I've been reminded recently, too, that campaign finance problems can also um, lead to criminal issues. So it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, we had a, a court of appeals judge in Franklin County who was re recently... Uh, sentenced to 10 days in jail, which he served. Um, it all stemmed from his, the campaign finance, um, how, uh, how he spent it. Uh, I think that caught a lot of people's attention that if, if, if a court's going to send a, a court of appeals judge to jail for 10 days, which he actually served, uh, this, is, this is some real stuff that needs to be followed. Um, another minute, yeah. As Don touched on, too, we're, uh, some people are describing the current era as the wild west of campaign finance. Um, I've been practicing in this area nine years, um, and I'd say it's been pretty rapid-fire changes as far as uh, Citizens United, um, trying to figure out how to, um, a lot of entities are going uh, to using 501c4s, general welfare organizations, um, which can engage in issue advocacy, and that's where you see the commercials that don't, they don't say, don't vote for someone or vote for someone. They say, call your congressman and thank him for what a great job he's doing and realizing we have a serious issue here. Uh, so it's more issue advocacy. But uh, that's becoming a very um, 
common way to, to finance um, what essentially is uh, a political dialogue. Um, there's also super PACs, which you hear about in the news at the federal level. Essentially what that there is, it's a political committee that um, works independently of the candidate. You cannot communicate, coordinate with the candidate. But if you're a super PAC, you can accept unlimited contributions. You can accept cor corporate contributions. Um, so that's also become a popular way to finance political dialogue. Um, Ohio law does not allow for super PACs, but what happens is um, groups will form a federal PAC, and in Ohio, you're allowed to give money to state and local candidates. Um, that's not true in every state. Uh, states vary greatly on their campaign finance. Um, and so with it being the Wild West right now, I mean, who knows what the future will be? Um, who knows what the next big court case will be, which will change the way everyone does this? Um, usually, if there's a bombshell violation of campaign finance laws, that can generate more laws and regulations and that kind of thing. Um, and I was trying to rush through the end because I know we're limited on time. Don, do you have any thoughts on anything I said? Uh, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, one, Ohio doesn't have any statutes dealing with super PACs, but there is an advisory opinion from the Ohio Elections Commission saying that Ohio is going to comply with uh, Citizens United so the corporations can spend money independently and uncoordinated. The net result of the failure to change the statutes, which is, you know, they've done, they have not changed the statutes, means that by virtue of a quirk in Ohio's law, the disclosure requirements that are present in the FEC for federal elections are not present for uh, state super PACs. So it's theoretically possible to have a a, a really dark, uh, dark super PAC if it's in Ohio only. Uh, secondly, we were talking about something we could disagree about to be entertained. <laughs> yeah. and, and I was trying to find something, we were, we were scratching ourselves, but one of the things that I would slightly disagree with, although not really in terms of what he said, is the virtue, go ahead. Oh. You want to come up? Um, I would disagree with the virtue of disclosure as a principle, obviously it's the law. Um, if, if what you're trying to achieve is um, eliminating corruption and having the public see who might be trying to influence you, and, and obviously if you're going to regulate speech by, by or regulate the amount of money people give, you need to know who's given and how much. You know, disclosure is necessary for all those things. But Brad Smith has, has, opted, has suggested a different way of actually accomplishing this if anti-corruption is really what we're after. Require all campaign contributions to be anonymous, in cash, or by cashier's check, and make it a crime equivalent to bribery to ever disclose to the candidate this, that you had made the contribution. So if the candidate could not know who is benefiting uh, the candidate, then there could be no possibility of corruption. But in order for that to work, you would have to prohibit disclosure. Uh, that, that's my preferred uh, uh, solution, but I'm not holding my breath on it. Um, the, the other thing that's coming up that might uh, actually change things significantly, although we'll see, Trump has been speaking about getting rid of the Johnson Amendment, which was passed by the uh, U.S. Congress in the 1950s because a a religious organization criticized then Senator LBJ. LBJ didn't like it. LBJ was president of the Senate. LBJ got a, an amendment to, to the, the uh, tax law that was passed this year that prohibited 501c3 entities, including all churches and religious organizations, from intervening in any way in, in a political campaign uh, for a candidate. And if they did, they would lo lose their 501c3 status and all their contributions would be, would be taxable. Um, I think there's only been one enforcement of that that's, that's, that's gone around because somebody was really thumbing their nose and they lost. But other than that, it's, it's, it's uh, something that uh, the problem is when are you doing religious preaching and when are you saying, you know, maybe Hillary or Trump is the Antichrist and that's a religious view that you hold and you want to, want to communicate that to your folks, but, but you're prohibited to do, doing that by the Johnson Amendment. We have about 15 minutes for questions, so um, if you would like to ask a question, please just raise your hand and um, direct your question either at both of our speakers or just one of them. But. Uh, well, you 
this on? Yeah, can you hear me now or not? No. Yeah. Ah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the examples was given by the Washington Post the last day or two, which is to say that in, until the Washington Post broke the story, the Clinton campaign and her lawyer fervently denied that they had anything to do with funding or financing the Trump Russian to Astasie. Turns out they did. Turns out that, that the DNC and the Clinton campaign funneled money to their lawyers which were reported as, as expenditures for their lawyers, and their lawyers, who denied having anything to do with it, uh, funnel, funnel money to, to the, uh, the uh, Russian spy who was involved with it, or whoever it was that was involved with it, the, uh, the Trump uh, uh, dossier. So you can hire a consultant. You can report that you paid the consultant. The consultant hires other consultants. And um, I, you know, this is something that is done in enforcement is ra rather difficult. So uh, this, this is one way to hide expenditure sides of it. And obviously there are other ways to, to hide contribution sides of it as we've talked about super PACs. Go ahead. Yeah, you're referring to the Susan B. Anthony case, Susan B. Anthony versus the Ohio Elections Commission. And this was a case involving the Susan B. Anthony Fund published a statement uh, saying that uh, Democratic congressman from a pro-life district near Cincinnati, Driehaus, had uh, voted to, to, for taxpayer-funded abortions when he voted for Obamacare. Driehaus said that wasn't true. Uh, a panel, and by the way, I saw the argument on this. They had a brilliant lawyer, uh, Jim Bopp, for, who, who's arguing in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, knows campaign law better than I ever will, did a really terrible argument because he was trying to lecture these people and had a, a, a chart that was so complicated that the, the panel said, well, we need to have a full hearing to figure out what the facts are because you've confused us. Not really the way to go in front of the panel, but he thought it was a good idea. Um, the, <laughs> Uh, loss, the, the, so they were, they filed a lawsuit saying that Ohio's false statement statute, which, requ which re required uh, the Ohio Elections Commission to determine whether or not a statement was true or false, it could not find them, but it could uh, say, I publicly reprimand you, which has all the effect of me shaking my finger, or they could refer it for criminal prosecution, kind of like a, a uh, gatekeeper function, like, like a grand jury, that if, if you can't prosecute a false statement unless and until the Ohio Elections Commission reviews it and, and decides that you, that you have a, a, a false statement worthy of criminal prosecution. The Sixth Circuit said that's unconstitutional um, because it, it vests in, in the state um, certain authority in an inappropriate way. You have compulsory discovery, you, you, this is potentially criminal, and you are chilling speech, which you know, it was the idea. Now the only uh, entity in Ohio that does that in a fairly aggressive manner is the Ohio Supreme Court when you were a ju judge race. Because they don't think that, that the laws that apply to common candidates apply to, to judges when they are campaigning. And therefore, although they will speak as if you have to prove a false statement in practice, they mean by a false statement something that is susceptible of a false interpretation rather than something that is insusceptible of a true interpretation, which is how it applies to other candidates. So they know that constitutionally they can't get away with saying ambiguous statements are, are punished anymore. So they've changed what they call it, but they are punishing ambiguous statements if you were running for, for judge. Otherwise, you can say anything you want to as long as it's not defamatory. If I run against Corey and I say, Corey has given money to Planned Parenthood and it's a lie, he could sue me for defamation. If I'm writing against Corey and say, I saved a child from a burning building and it's alive, it's no defamation. And I'm allowed to do that under the, under the uh, current law of Ohio and under the Sixth Circuit statement in, in, in uh, the Susan B. Anthony case. We've talked about, and our offices have talked about, uh, along with some other interested parties, ways in which um, a more limited false statement statute could be upheld, but we're not there yet. I don't think the legislature has interest in it right now. I just have a few things to add. Just a couple comments to add. Um, 
Yeah, both Don and I are familiar with that law getting struck down because uh, we used to spend a couple weeks leading up to each election with three or four of these cases each. Um, yeah, as Don mentioned, I, I've heard rumblings they're going to try to put something in the books that would survive uh, constitutional scrutiny. Um, what should candidates do now that are feel there's a false statement? Uh, I don't know if that was part of your question. Um, what what some clients and, and candidates are still doing is still filing the cases, mm -hmm. even knowing that uh, they're going to get dismissed eventually, but you still get the publicity of there's a pending complaint at the commission uh, of a false statement. Um, you know, uh, some court cases would tell you the, the best remedy for false speech is more speech, so it gives candidates a platform to speak about why it's false and you'll get a news story out of it. And then, yeah, I think a lot of attorneys in the state who are specializing in this area, if it fits the defamation, uh, that would be something we would look at as a possible remedy. Of course, that's going to be a year or two after. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get you the immediate uh, uh, result you need before the election. But, um, yeah, it's kind of an unknown period um, uh, when that went off the books. So, or struck down, I should say. Go ahead. Oh, the one I spoke about? Actually, it happens quite frequently. Oh, oh you mean the, the one who uh, came to me late? Yeah, what we did is we uh, had him refund all the money he had raised so far and asked, and most of the people were willing to re rewrite checks, but we thought this isn't the kind of news story you want um, <laughs> right out of the gates that you messed up. Uh, it's just so important not to put the cart before the horse because I know we both worked with candidates who are just so excited to finally be running for something. It's been a lifelong dream. They're ramped up and get rolling before they stop and ask what are the requirements. Um, and then, uh, if I could, um, you had asked, I, I think the, uh, the Secretary of State's office does a very good job uh, auditing reports. Um, they have a full team, very knowledgeable. Some have been there many, many years. Um, and they do find the, the errors and, and ask you to correct them. So. Um, you know, mistakes are going to happen, as I said, so they'll point them out to you and allow you to try to, to fix them so they're, you're disclosing what you need to disclose. So I, I would give high marks uh, for the, how that's worked. Um, the people in that office, too, um, I think there's still a few there that predate uh, the um, current Secretary of State, so I don't feel it's overly political. Mm -hmm. I, maybe Don would disagree, but no. Yeah, it's, I mean, they're, they're just uh, government employees doing a good job, you know, analyzing these and, and trying to get point you in the right direction. So. Yeah, I, I think both the Secretary of State's office and the AG's office, at least at the staff level, are less political than they once were. And you've got people there who are doing their job, but doing a good job under Republican Secretary of State's, under Democratic Secretary of State's. And, yeah, it's not immediate, but they, they, they get to it in a prompt fashion, and if there are mistakes, they try to find them. Any other questions? Well, for example, if hypothetically I am, say, the Democratic National Committee, and I decide to pay someone to create opposition research for the benefit of the, the, the Clinton campaign, um, some people would say that that is an in-kind contribution, and some per person just filed a lawsuit about that yesterday. So we'll see. Um, but in, in general, if, if you provide something other than money, whether it's office space, whether it, it's phone lines, whether it's a use of an employee who you are paying, uh, whether it's food and drink, uh, that is an in-kind contribution. And, and you would say, I have paid uh, Mark's Catering $100, and you listed it as an expenditure to Mark's Catering. You also listed it as a contribution to Corey Colombo for president, you know, because it was for a fundraiser raise, raise for him. And, and that's how it's reported. But anything that's not cash, that's a value that you transmit, you know, like you know, the, the, the rum and alcohol that George Washington gave, he would have had to report that under current law. Go ahead.
main, main, main points is issue campaigns, no limits, uh, unlimited corporate contributions. Um, you still have to report if you are a, 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 a issue only PAC. Um, if the issue PAC is not an issue only PAC, if it also gives to candidates, then it's subject to all the candidate PAC restrictions. But basically, uh, talking about issues is a core constitutional right, and in, in Ohio, it's been protected since the, the late 1950s. There was an Ohio Supreme Court case, and nationally, uh, at least, uh, I think, predated Citizens United. There was a, uh, some U.S. Supreme Court case that said you can't prohibit under McCain-Feingold uh, corporations from spending unlimited amounts to, to affect issues. Um, yes and no. Um, they are this. They're 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 very similar. Let's put it that way. Is that fair? Yeah. I and actually, um, as moderator, um, I'm going to ask you a question as well. It seems to me, based on what you said, that if you are smart, savvy, and hire smart lawyers like the two of you, you can get around most of these rules and regulations, right? So, c could you comment on that? Because it seems to me you you've given us pretty good devices right here, you know. So. Isn't that, I mean, I sort of, I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this, and, and I admit that I, I come to this, I, I don't know much about it, you know, but listening to you speak, I'm going, wait a second, you know, I can, you know, I can get around all this pretty easily. Um, I, 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 can we leave I, our cards here? No, no, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll leave our cards. Um, yes, and ironically, I mean, one of the things that, I, yes, we, we both benefit from be, because election law is complicated, you have to hire lawyers to do it. Ironically, what they're trying to accomplish through regulation, one, they're not accomplishing. What they are accomplishing is creating barriers to entry, to have people who are not associated with the Republican Party or with the Democratic Party or with some established institution are shut out because they're going to fall, fall afoul of one of these things. They might not have the money to hire somebody, and, and they're, they're going to be gone after. And, and I, you know, although I like the job, and, and the work we do, I, I'm not sure as a policy matter that, that this is really the, the, what the Republican founders had in mind. Yeah, no, I, I that's, you asked a very tough question. Um, and, you know, it's, I'd say like any other area of the law, it's a cat and mouse game. I mean, there's people find new ways to do things, new regulations, it goes back and forth. Um, I guess at the heart of it, though, is there are some distinctions in place why uh, certain money doesn't have to be disclosed. So, for example, the 501c4s, which are also known as dark money sometimes in the media, uh, you know, one of the one of the realities there is uh, they have to put, uh, dis you know, they have to uh, lost my train of thought. Uh, they they're involved more in issue advocacy, so they're speaking of issues that. Um, comply with their uh, general welfare purpose. So there, um, some of these things where there's more less disclosure, there might be more restrictions on how they can spend the money. Uh, they can't come out and say, vote for this candidate. Um, but yeah, it's, I guess like any area of the law, there's going to be loopholes. I, you know, yeah, and, and, and I, I didn't mean to criticize you no, and the no, work that you do all. more. It was really more a policy question, as right. Don put it, right. you know, as, as a policy, it seems to me that there's something wrong with the way that, that, that we go about regulating these issues. So I think we have time for one more question or two quick ones. State law is basically mirrors federal law. It, it, it phrases a little bit differently, but, it, but it, it, uh, the analysis will, will be the same. Any one more question, perhaps? And if nobody in the audience has a question, I do have another tough question, which has to do with Citizens United. And you know, um, one of you mentioned it briefly in your remarks, but this whole idea of money in politics, I think Don said something about you, know, you need to have money to have a platform to speak, but it seems to me that right now in the United States we have pretty exorbitant amounts of money that, that, are, that are involved, which is really different from many other Western democratic nations where those amounts are 
much less, right? So uh, just briefly, these could be your concluding remarks. What do you think of this idea of money in politics? Is it a, a good idea to, to, to regulate it, or do you not think it's an issue at all? Um, I would suggest that European countries are, are socialist to a greater degree than the American Republican democracy is. And we have a free speech in our Constitution which England does not have, France does not have, Germany does not have. If you criticized, as someone did, the hair of the German chancellor, if you're German, he can sue you, you know, because it's bringing disrepute. If you criticize Islam in France, you have committed a crime. You know, if, you know, if the, America doesn't do that. We basically think that speech is a good thing, and the purpose of, of money is to communicate. More money doesn't necessarily mean you win. Trump was outspent by Hillary. He won. You know, I, I didn't predict it. Most people didn't, but it happened. You know, there are other people. You know, Huffington, when he ran for Senate in California, outspent his opponent. People got to know Huffington. They didn't like him. They voted for the other person. You know, th th this, this happens. Um, you know, knowing somebody better doesn't necessarily improve. But the purpose of, of money in politics and communicating, uh, the legitimate purpose, is not for the benefit of the candidate, certainly not for, for the benefit of the governing class who has an interest in limiting sources of power outside themselves and often view limiting sources of power outside themselves as promoting the common good, as the Europeans generally, generally do. Um, but rather so that the citizens of the United States who get to make the choice have access to information. They may get more information than they want. They may get more information than they need. But it is better to have more information than you need than less information than you need. And if the government or the elites, which is really what we're talking about, say there's too much politics, there's too much money, and we're going to limit how much money you can spend on speech, we are limiting how much you can speak, and we are limiting how much citizens and what citizens can hear. Uh, always hard to follow up uh, after Don, because <laughs> that was a good answer. But, uh, you know, a few, a few thoughts that come to mind is at the heart of this is the First Amendment. So you're going to have speech, and uh, court cases would tell you you want a robust debate, um, especially when picking your leaders. Um, you know, it's an evolution of these laws, but I think um, over time it's settled into a pretty good place where, uh, you know, some reasonable regulations are in place. Um, a lot of these regulations came about by past abuses throughout the history of people running for office. Um, and, and, you know, in the election law world, there's a very wide spectrum of how people feel about regulations. And I, I don't want, we, we brought up the name Brad Smith a few times. If I understand his position correctly, he's, he's in this uh, uh, election law also. Um, at one time I heard him speak and he said people should be able to take in whatever money they want and spend whatever they want from whoever they want as long as it's disclosed. I mean that right there could be your system and, and maybe some of uh, the next speakers this might be a good segue to their topic because uh, in academics and in the election law world there's debates about what regulations are actually necessary and serving some sort of purpose. Um, and then the last thought, I've been, been to a few of these seminars where people do bring up that it is staggering when you hear the dollar amount being spent on elections, but when you compare it to something like McDonald's or Coke, uh, it's a minuscule amount. So don't, I, I mean, I think it's, it's a good thing that there's that much messaging when you're picking your leaders. Uh, you know, it's still relatively small and concentrated right before the elections. Um, so, um, but yeah, that's what I would add to what Don said. Great. Well, we're going to take a short break, but we, before we do that, please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers. And please help yourselves to refreshments, and then the next program will start in about five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, hi. My name is Susan Murnan. I'm co-president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland. My other co-president is over on the that side over there. Wave your hand, Marcia. Marcia Goldberg. League of Women Voters is best known for its educational outreach at election time, for our nonpartisan 
voters guides. In recent years, we have been pioneering a new system and we are very proud of it. Vote 411. Out on the table in the hallway, you will find lots of these little cards. This is our nationwide online voters guide. Very cool. Type your address into it and your ballot will come up just as it will appear in the voting place. And you will receive unbiased information on candidates and issues, including issue one and issue two in this election cycle. Pick up extras. I have a whole stack of these out there. Give them away to your friends and family. It's a very useful device. League of Women Voters is a non-profit, non-partisan political organization. That means that we do not support or endorse candidates or political parties. But we do have a 501c4 arm which does issue advocacy. At this point in time, we are part of the Fair Districts for Ohio Coalition. Also at our table in the hallway, you will find information about that and you will have the opportunity, if you have not already done so, to sign a petition to put our proposal for congressional redistricting reform on the November 2018. Audrey, please stand up. This is our young lady who has the petition. Look for her. I wish to thank the Cleveland Marshall College of Law and the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association for co-sponsoring this event. League of Women Voters has been advocating for reducing the influence of money in politics since the 1970s. In 2014, League of Women Voters US, um, acknowledging the change in the legal environment since the 1970s, engaged in a two-year review and update of our position on campaign finance. You can find a statement of our current position on the League of Women Voters US website and a lot of our background information on it if you are interested. In general, League of Women Voters believes that a system of campaign financing should be transparent, should enhance citizen equality, should enable candidates to compete equitably, and should combat corruption. At the conclusion of our two-year study, we enjoined our local leagues to become more actively engaged in reforming money and politics at the state and local level. Again, acknowledging political realities. If campaign financing is going to become more accountable to the general public, it is going to have to happen at the state and local level. This forum is our first effort in this direction here in Cleveland because we found we didn't know anything about state and local financing in Ohio. I'm very excited about this opportunity and very grateful to Cleveland Marshall and the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association and I hope everybody is finding this as valuable an educational experience as I am. At this point in time, I would like to introduce the panelists for the next symposium. Uh, Catherine Turser, who is the Executive Director of Common Cause. I don't believe Common Cause needs any introduction. Everybody knows Common Cause. <laughs> and Sindra Miller-Cole, who is with the Racy Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron. And Thank you all very much for coming here today. So I'm Sindra, and like she said, I am a professor at the Bliss Institute of Applied Politics down at the University of Akron. My baby class is campaign finance, so unlike the two speakers before, I don't practice the law, I just teach it. So uh, it's a little bit different. I've also raised money for candidates at all levels and independent expenditure only committees, so you know, I have that side of the experience as well. Um, 
I start my class in campaign finance with two different things, and I found it interesting that we were talking about Mark Hanna earlier because one of his quotes is one of my favorites, and it's that there are two really important things in politics. Money is one, and I can't remember the other. So, you know, I mean, yeah, it, the reason we're all here, right, money. And then the other thing, um, I, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with John Green, but he, is, uh, the, he was the director of the Bliss Institute down at the University of Akron and is uh, one of the most knowledgeable folks about campaign finance. I, I was actually privileged to take his campaign finance class when I was a student. And he started the class by saying um, that money, like water, will always find a crack. So as much as we can try and put these regulations and limitations on it, how much is it really worth it at the end of the day? Because if people want their money to play a part in the political system, it's, we're, we're always going to be able to find a way to do so. And I challenge my students, like I'm going to challenge you right now, to you know, try and not be so jaded about it because we would like to hope that there was a way to to make things better and to you know kind of seal some of those cracks but uh, the Supreme Court uh, in a couple of their cases has actually quoted the hydraulic theory that I just mentioned to you so apparently they have the same feelings um, as my colleagues do so I just wanted to talk about a couple different ways that states and local uh, entities are regulating campaign finance. We talked a little bit about the laws here in Ohio, but really the way to drive campaign finance reform is at the local and state levels. And there are three ways that um, state and local entities are really, really looking at reforming campaign finance. The first is disclosure requirements. The second is the contribution limits. And the third is public financing of elections. So. Um, just, ju I mean, you guys heard about it earlier and all of you seem pretty knowledgeable, but just to go through them real quickly, I mean, disclosure is, is just basically the reporting requirements, whether it's at the local level through the Board of Elections, the state level through the Secretary of State's office or the federal level uh, at the FEC. Um, and then contribution limits, is it limits on how much you know, people are giving to the campaigns, et cetera. And then public financing is something I'll get into a little bit more. Um, first, looking at the disclosure and reporting requirements. Um, this is the driving force behind a lot of legislation right now, um, looking at uh, campaign finance and campaign finance regulations. It's, it's being done through this dis disclosure and reporting requirements avenue. Um, of the 700 bills that were introduced in 2015 across state legislatures in the United States, 300 of them were looking at disclosure and reporting requirements. So that shows um, that state legislatures are actually looking at that uh, most significantly. Also, um, while the reporting requirements and schedules vary, um, most states require the disclosure of contributions annually right before an election, and then soon after the election. Ohio is no stranger to that. We, if, if someone is not up for election, they're disclosing their contributions annually. If they are up for election, you know, there is a stricter time schedule. Um, if you are fundraising for a campaign or a treasurer or something, I encourage you to go to the Ohio Secretary of State's website, and they print off. I mean, you can just print off a one-pager with all of the uh, reporting dates on it, and it's easy to follow, and then you know, you don't have to run to your lawyer's office and say, oh my gosh, I, I filed everything at 4.15 instead of 4 o'clock, what do I do? Um, let's see. For, for the most part, like I said, um, disclosure reporting is done on those schedules. Um, but in some states, they have it where uh, if you are receiving a large contribution, you have to disclose that within 24 hours. It's not something that we have here in Ohio, but in other states, a lot of times that threshold is $200. If you, as a campaign, raise $200 from a single source, you have to disclose that information within 24 hours. Some states, that number increases a little bit to 1,000, but for the most part, if you are implementing a rule like that in a state, a lot of times that threshold starts at $200. So. Um, I mean, it, I think that that's something, you know, when, when we were asked to do this, we were supposed to give our opinions on these things, and I think, you know, I have opinions about everything. So, I mean, I think that that's a good way. We all want to know, okay, who, who are the players in politics? And when, when you're a candidate, you want to know what you're up against and who you're up against, and I think that's a good way 
um, for you to really see what it is that you're up against. A lot of fundraising events, for example, start at $250 just to get in the door. Well, if you have a threshold starting at $200, you can see within 24 hours, okay, well, I know Candidate Y had an event down in Dayton, and it was $250 a ticket, so I can see exactly who was there and exactly who, who the players are on this person's, you know, campaign in Dayton. So, I mean, I think that that, that could be a good start. Um, let's see. Um, next, I want to talk about contribution limits. Here in Ohio, um, we have contribution limits that are set, at the statewide level at least, based on inflation. So it started in 2006 that for a statewide office or the state legislature, state, um, any contribution was $10,000. That was the max. Now it is upwards of 12000 and it goes down to the penny. I don't, I don't know exactly what, what it is, but it's like 12000 maybe, you know, 700 something. 12700 7 and 79 cents. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. And when you're fundraising, look, me, the fundraiser, doesn't even know what the penny amount is. I mean, it's just ridiculous to have to call somebody and be like, hey, you know, you only did 12,500, but maybe another $207, and you know, that could really make a difference. It's, it's ridiculous. There's my real opinion. Um, so there are some states across the country that have no contribution limits at the state level, which is kind of surprising, actually, because you would think that no contribution limits at all wouldn't even be something that we're talking about at the state level. I feel like at the state level is where you can really work on contribution limits, but in fact there are 11 states that have no limit on individual donor contributions. So um, those states include Alabama, Indiana, Iowa, Mississippi, um, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas. I mean, so we have some big states and states that you know, you wouldn't necessarily think you would see in that mix that are that are involved. Um, there, taking those states out of the equation, though, um, there is Ohio happens to have the largest, the highest limit on individual contributions for the state senate and state house levels, which I was kind of surprised to find out. So, you know, we don't have that that. Uh, and, or un, unlimited amount, but we do have the highest amount. After, well, if we're going to have the highest amount, why don't we just get rid of them? I mean, I know why, but still. Um, the national average, though, for somebody running for governor, um, the national average is about $5,600. That, that's the individual contribution limit here in Ohio. Like I said, we're higher than that. We're at 12000 But the highest limit across the country is in New York, and it's $50,000. So somebody running for governor in New York can accept uh, Fifty thousand dollars in individual contributions from an individual. Um, the lowest is five hundred, and that's in Alaska. So, um, I've seen locally where low contribution limits. When you see it, and when you think, okay, five hundred dollars, somebody has to run for office on five hundred dollar individual contributions. How does that happen? Well, the city of Akron actually has pretty low um, contribution limits. I think theirs is three hundred or some, three. Okay, three fifty and. You know, you think, okay, well, that that's great. You know, people, money's not going to play a big role. And but if you look at the city of Akron and the people that have been in charge there, we're not changing leadership very often. I mean, Mayor Pasquale was one of the longest-serving mayors in the country, and I think that in those situations, maybe name ID is is driven up, and the importance of name ID becomes, you know, it, you're not able to close the gap as a challenger against that name ID when you're only able to raise contributions, it, it, you know, in a $350 increment. So, um, and then the national, um, okay, so there's that. Uh, looking though also at state party contribution limits, now I've been talking a lot about political campaigns, but state parties also have to raise money and are also a significant player when it comes to campaign finance. And there are actually 18 states that impose no restrictions on the state party's ability to raise money from individuals. Ohio is not one of those. We do have limits on what we can give to our state party. but. Um, in other states, the state party is required to follow the same limit that is on campaigns from individuals. In Ohio, we're different. We can give more to state and local parties than what we can to a candidate. Um, corporate contributions, I was actually surprised to find out that in 22 states, corporate contributions, um, I'm sorry, 22 states completely prohibit corporate contributions, which is Ohio is one of them, um, unless you're talking about an independent expenditure only committee. Um, but another six um, allow corporations to contribute an unlimited amount of money, which I just found astounding that corporations can 
just write a check to whoever they want for however much they want. I mean, obviously they're accountable to the board, but still that unlimited threshold just seems extreme to me for a corporation. Um, and then the last that I wanted to talk about as far as uh, contribution limits are concerned is political action committees. Um, in 13 states, PACs contribute an, an unlimited amount of money to state campaigns. Here in Ohio, if you're looking at a traditional political action committee, they are limited by the law with how much you can contribute to a political campaign um, for a candidate. And then the last, which is something that we don't talk about a lot, but it's um, public financing of political campaigns. And I think this is maybe the way of the future at the state and local level because of, you know, because of court decisions like Citizens United and things like that. When you look at public financing as an option, you know, that's, that's a different, that's, that's a whole different playing field, that's a whole different level. There are 13 states that provide some form of public financing for campaigns within their states. Um, and they typically go through it two different ways. One is called the Clean Elections Program, and the other one is a Matching Funds Program. So basically, the Clean Elections Program, um, this is offered in Arizona, Connecticut, and Maine. They're the only three states that do it. But basically, if you want to run for office in one of those three states at the state level, you have to raise money in $5 increments. So you have to go out and you know get all of your friends and colleagues and whoever to donate $5 to your campaign. Um, and depending on the level that you're running for, so if you're running for governor, you're going to need to raise more money than if you're running for state rep or state senate, but you have to raise whatever the threshold is in those states to demonstrate that you have enough support to warrant your run for office. So if you can prove that you have this good groundswelling of support and enough people are going to support your run for office, then you can qualify for, um, for uh, public financing of your campaign. Um, in Arizona, for example, you have to raise $5 contributions from at least 200 people. Um, and then it, it, once you do that, you're eligible for, for public financing of your campaign. Um, the program there is funded through a 10% surcharge on all civil penalties and criminal fees um, and civil penalties paid by the candidates. So that's how they fund it. A lot of times when you talk about public financing, it's okay, well, great, that's a great idea, but how are we going to fund it? Is it just the $3 check off on our tax, reform, uh, on our tax forms or you know, do we have to do, what else do we need to do beyond that? The next one is a matching funds program. And this is in the rest of the states um, that, that have public financing, so I think that's 10, 10 other states. And basically, um, it, in a situation like that, um, Hawaii does it, for example. And in Hawaii, the, the most that you, there's an expenditure limit for a campaign, okay? And the expenditure limit is 1,597,000 and some odd dollars. So, the state of Hawaii will provide up to 10% of that in matching, in, in matching funds. And what you have to do as a candidate, so let's say I'm running for governor of Hawaii. During the primary election season, whether or not I'm, I have a primary opponent, I have to raise $100,000 on my own. If I raise $100,000, then during the general election, the state of Hawaii is going to match me at $100,000. Um, and then after that, I have to raise, so, but that, that only gets me $100,000, okay, in public funds. And they're willing to do up to 10% of the expenditure limits. So that leaves with another 59 some odd thousand dollars that I have to raise during the general election that they will then match. So if, if I accept this public matching, I can only go up to that one point. Uh, one five nine million dollar threshold of expenditures, but they're going to give me ten percent of the funds to do so. So, for a candidate that has a difficult time raising money, for example, that's that's maybe a good idea to do something like that because you're getting ten percent of your funds right off the bat if you can raise that hundred thousand dollars in the primary season. But when you do it, you have to limit yourself to that expenditure threshold. So, if you don't accept the public funding, then you don't have to adhere to that expenditure threshold and you could spend two million or five million on your race knowing that your opponent's only going to spend, you know, that just over one million dollars on it. So um, the program there is funded through a tax return check off, much like we're used to for federal uh, campaign finance matching dollars. They just have a separate one on their state forms and they, they do it that way. Um, there is also public financing for parties in some states, 
which is interesting. And there, most of them are funded also through a tax checkoff ranging from $1 to $25. So political parties are being funded. We don't do that here. Um, and so, so then with those, I went through and was like, okay, well, you know, here's these three ways that we could look at reforming the campaign finance system. What are the best practices across the country? And the places that are doing it the best for each of those different ways to, to reform the system, who's doing it best? Where are we doing it best? What can we do, be doing if we want to do it the best? So I have just a couple suggestions. The first is, um, as far as disclosure is, is concerned, the best practices require the disclosure of the contributor's name, occupation, employer, and complete address. So we do that in Ohio. When you're filing all those campaign finance reports, the deadline that is today, they're all going to have that information available as long as they're able to get all of that information and you know give their best effort to get it. So we check off that box when it comes to best practices. Um, another one is, another type of best practice is to identify the contributor, which you know, you think, okay, identify the contributor. Well, how, how difficult is that? If it's an individ individual, you just write their name. But the, where, the places that they do it best, listen to these designations that they have as far as identifying the contributor. So they have anonymous, a business group, organization, a candidate spouse, a committee, an individual, a self, and a state committee. And then there are further ways that you can identify based on what it is that they're giving to. But you know, when you think about it, in Ohio, you don't have to write candidate spouse. That's not a thing. You know, it, that's not one of the drop down boxes that you're selecting. Or, you know, I mean, self, yeah, I guess you figure it out quite quickly, quite quickly. But when you're searching, you don't search based on those options. You're not looking up candidate spouse. You're not looking up self. You know, it's, so it just makes it a little bit easier to figure out, okay, how much is the candidate funding their own campaign versus you know, what they're getting from these different types of organizations. Um, another best practice is to list contributors' aggregate contributions. If I want to know how much Mike Barron is giving to candidates across the country, I would have, or you know, candidates across the state, I would have to, you know, look him up, and then it's going to give me a list of every time Mike's name shows up, but not come up with this aggregate for how much he has contributed in this election cycle or every election cycle. Best practices would say, if I look up his name, I'm going to get a column that shows this is how much he contributed forever, and we know how big of a political player he is, and then here's the breakdown of where he gave the money. So when you have those big donors or someone that you're interested in or you know, somebody even just combing through the numbers to look at potential donors for their campaign, you know, you're going to figure out whether or not somebody is who you need to target or not pretty quickly. Um, <coughs> the next best practice is differentiating and clearly identifying the transaction types. So when you're doing something like that, you're going to be able to see right off the bat whether or not something is a direct contribution, an in-kind contribution like we were talking about earlier, loan, a loan repayment, an unitemized contribution, or a return contribution. And that information isn't necessarily hard to find when you're combing through Ohio campaign finance um, databases, but when you are itemizing it like that right off the bat, um, you, you know, and can look at that in somebody's aggregate donation totals, that, that's something that's helpful as well. And in Ohio, we do a good job. I mean, you have to itemize what people, where they're giving money, what them, we even go as far as if money is given for a political event, you can see, you know, what, what event that money was given for. So uh, we do a pretty good job of that here. Another best practice is provide the date on which each transaction occurred. Well, I mean, we do that. And then the timeliness of filings is another thing. One of the best practices is what I was mentioning earlier, where if you give a large contribution, it's disclosed within 24 hours. Um, and the next, the next one looks at the accessibility of the data. And basically, you know, in, in some places, data, the campaign finance is not done electronically. It's still, you know, written down and submitted to the Board of Elections. Thankfully, here in Ohio, for the most part, everything is, is electronic, so we are able to access anything at our fingertips as soon as, as, soon as it's filed. Um, but the best practices for that are require filers to submit digitized reports, provide searchable and downloadable campaign finance data, and provide all campaign finance data free of charge. So again, we do a pretty, pretty fair job of that in Ohio. Um, 
I'm going to turn it over now to Catherine and then would be happy to take questions once she is done. Hi, everybody. How are you all this morning? Uh, so nothing makes me more irritated than people saying, oh, well, you know, the money's going to get there anyway, so we shouldn't do anything. I mean, we have, you know, we have some rules against murder, even though murder occurs, and we have speed limits, though I, I hate to say this, I traveled very quickly up I-71 to get to you all. Um, and so as we're thinking about whether it's worth having some rules to rein in some of the worst excesses, well, it makes some really good sense. Um, so I got the message just uh, last week that the State House was holding a hearing today. And I was a little bit sad that I wasn't able to, you know, to go, but I was like, I was very excited to get here. And, um, but I thought, you know, I better check in with the chair and I better see what's going on so I know exactly what the rules are so I can tell other redistricting reformers, you know, what the rules are. And this was one of the rules. They wanted 10 to 20 copies. Okay, well that seems really reasonable, right? You, you wanna have written copies so you can check to make sure what somebody's testifying about. The other thing that they wanted to be sure that everyone knew is they had five to seven minutes. So, you know, when we talk about free speech and the importance of free speech, it's important to realize in our public space, we have made accommodations related to free speech so that we can function better, so that we can hear other voices, so there's an opportunity to participate. And so when you start to think about, like for example, I love the Declaration of Independence, right? How about, um, so if I decided to go outside right now and to tell everyone who walked by, uh, I was gonna read the Declaration of Independence, no problem, right? What if I wanted to go next to your house and I wanted to get a bullhorn and I wanted to do it at four o'clock in the morning? Do you think you might call the cops? You would be violating my First Amendment rights. And so when we start to talk about money and free speech, it's important to realize that when it comes to our community, when it doesn't have to do with political advertisements. We found ways to make accommodations so that people have an opportunity to talk and then the next person has an opportunity to talk. And so when we start talking about, okay, um, bags of money, I, I literally felt my head explode um, when um, there was a conversation about Brad Smith suggesting that every contribution should be anonymous and that people should just have bags of cash being given to, to campaigns. I was like, okay, let's, let's think about that. Isn't that what happened with Watergate? Is, you know, and isn't it likely that money started from another country? And you know, that's the point that in fact, we started passing some good reforms, uh, including contribution limits. Uh, and we know with Buckley versus Vallejo that they equated money with, with the gas to make the car go, right? that you need, you, know, you need that money to buy your yard signs, you need that money to get yourself to come talk, Cleveland State, for example. Um, and when we start thinking about money, I think it's important to think about the, the suggestions and the limitations that we're putting on this are for a public interest. And so we have to think about, and, and we need to kind of talk about the values that underlie that so that we can make sense of things. Okay, so why do we have disclosure? Why do we need disclosure? Well, we need to be able to con consider who is actually supporting the candidate or supporting an advertisement. Um, it can make a difference if, for example, it's supported by a pharmaceutical company or it's supported by a doctor or it's supported by you know, a local educator, it can make a difference um, who in fact is supporting something. Now one of the things I think is really interesting, I don't know if you all have heard of issue two, it's on the TV every once in a while. Um, you know, there's a pros, there's a con. And one of the things that was really interesting I thought was that the pharmaceutical companies came together to create a trade association to then give to the campaign. And so we all know it's pharmaceutical companies that are fighting back against issue two. But then we 
don't know which pharmaceutical companies. And the question is, why do they, why did they do this? And what, you know, what is it that they, you know, it's helpful that we understand and we, we have a good understanding of their pharmaceutical interests, we get it. Um, but it is interesting that those companies, we don't actually get that information. And so as we think about disclosure, um, let's take a step back, and I'm, I'm going to do federal level. Um, and when we think about 2016 and what happened with 2016, it's important to remember that um, there was some activity by Russians, right? Um, and we know there was all sorts of stuff going on on Facebook and Twitter, Twitter and social media, and yet we do not have good disclosure of the buys when it's related to social media. Now, this is something, so there's what they call, they're calling it, uh, they're calling it the honest act, I, which I kind of liked, you know, um, that whole idea of like, we should get that information. And I think, you know, as we change and the way that we get information changes, we need to be thinking about disclosure in a slightly different, a slightly different way. I think it's important to remember when um, Citizens, uh, uh, Citizens United versus FEC came down in 2010, we had opportunities to make some really good changes at both the, the, the federal level with the Disclose Act and also at the state level so that we would have good contribution information, good disclosure going back to the source of the original donor. Um, this was something that was passed in the Ohio Senate. It was sponsored um, by a guy named John Husted, who's now the Secretary of State. Um, it passed in the Ohio Senate and this was the point that um, the chambers were divided um, and it was the Democratic House that did not in fact pass the disclosure regulations for um, those political advertisements in light of the changes of Citizens United. Um, and that leaves us not having good, good information. So for example, the Chamber of Commerce has an affiliate called the Partnership for Ohio's Future. They run, basically they run ads that are related to judicial races, Supreme Court races, and um, they provide information so we know about the expenditures. So we get that at the Secretary of State, you know the expenditures, but we don't know the sources of contributions. Now we know it's the Chamber of Commerce, so you can say, okay, well we know it's business interest, but we don't know which businesses. And that is because we did not update this, this kind of disclosure, and it's something that we should really consider doing. The other thing is we're thinking about disclosure. It's important to have this kind of information, consider the source, et cetera, but it's also important to think about coordination. Okay, if in fact we are going to have a system where corporations give unlimited amounts to political advertisements, right, and, and they're spending, you know, our Supreme Court understood it to be not something that was corrupting because the candidates would somehow be separate from it, we need to do what we can to make sure the candidates actually are separate from it. So as you start to think about how do we address coordination, obviously we need to do that at the federal level, we also need to do it at the state level so that in fact those are as separated as much as possible so that there's good anti-coordination language. So uh, with disclosure, I think um, sunshine is the best disinfectant. It's one of the ways that we have an opportunity to get at what's actually happening and who's trying to play ball and who's trying to influence the political process. Hello, Mike. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden I'm like, <laughs> anyway, um, and, and I could get it. Um, so as we start to think about, um, as we start to think about the changes uh, in uh, in the political process related to um, the Citizens United versus FEC, a lot of us have thrown up our hands, right? We've just said, okay, if free speech is not really free, we've just kind of given up, on, we just kind of have given up on it, right? We've just said, okay, I, I don't know what to do. But we can, in fact, address disclosure 
And we can, in fact, have a conversation about contribution limits. Uh, now, one of the things that I really like that you highlighted had to do with what they call real-time disclosure. So nothing is more irritating to me <laughs> as somebody who hangs out near the State House, my, my uh, office is a block away, that, this, that basically what happens is during the time period of the budget, almost immediately in January, February, our legislative leaders are raising campaign contributions from lobbyists. They're having a bunch of fundraisers down there, and yet we do not get that campaign contribution information until July. So it's, it's a June 30 is the deadline for the information with a July, at the end of July filing. And so we know all these fundraisers are happening. Um, in many cases, they're more fundraisers than they're actually are members of the legislature. And we don't get that information until after the budget process is over. One of the most important policy documents our state legislatures make Mike, you're, you're falling down on your duties here, man. There's 60 of them, man. <laughs> I was trying to make things more interesting for you so that you had something to look at besides me. How's that? Um, so, but nothing is more irritating than knowing that in they are making incredibly important decisions, decisions that the lobbyists know are important, and yet we do not get that information until after the budget is all well and done and over. Well, real-time disclosure would address that. Um, and, and I always think, so this is the one, one problem with real-time disclosure, just so I, I'm gonna throw this out. For reporters, it becomes an inundation of data that it's coming in over and over and over again so that every day there might be a change and it becomes a, a monster when it comes to, as you imagine, the spreadsheets and trying to keep up with what's actually happening. And so there are ways to modify that to address some of the reporters' concerns. And the reporters, in fact, are the ones who are the most most likely to share this information with the public is to do them weekly. Like, get, you know, have a deadline, let's say Friday at 4 p.m., uh, that you do them weekly so that, that in fact we get some more real-time data. The contributions that are given during off-election years are the most likely to be tied not to an election, but to the contributor wanting something specific. And we deserve to have that information. Now, how many of you have actually said, wait a second, um, all right, a train wreck is a train wreck, right? Even if we get to see absolutely everything? Well, let's face it, our campaign finance system is a little bit of a train wreck, but it is well worth understanding and using that information as, as knowledgeable voters as much as possible. Um, so I also, I wanted to highlight another thing that you talked a little bit about was the public financing um, options. Now for a lot of us, um, when we start to think about, you know, you, there's nothing, you, you, you can't just eliminate big money. How many of you have just been like, well, we just don't want money in politics, we just want it over. Well, we could in fact amend the Constitution, that would be one option. Um, but in the meantime, we could start thinking about what are the things that we could do that would encourage small donations because it isn't the person necessarily who raises the most money that wins, right? We, we know that from the, the, the Trump uh, Clinton example, but what we do know is that if in fact a candidate doesn't have enough money to get their message out at all, well, they're, they're in real trouble. And so those small donor programs can make a big difference. Seattle has one that was just passed last year. Um, it's called, uh, they call them democracy vouchers. And this is for Seattle City Council. It has not yet been implemented for um, the mayor for this, you know, 2000, it'll be 2021 when that happens. Um, and basically every citizen that lives in uh, Seattle is given four vouchers for $25 a piece. And then you give them to the candidate and then the candidate is, you know, you know, or multiple candidates. Uh, the candidate then turns it into the city, and the city then gives some more resources to those candidates running for office. And so it's about kind of creating the ability for candidates to get their message out, rely on smaller donors, so that, in fact, they're not having to feel as much pressure from the big guys. 
Um, we'll see how this works. It's an interesting experiment. How much money will it cost and how much money um, where does it come from? Budget? So it is something that they, they set aside. They actually passed a, a budget increase. And I'm sorry, I don't have the actual numbers off the top of my head. Um, it may be something that Sindra has. Um, but what is interesting is to think that, that the, the city, the, the voters of Seattle passed a, passed a tax increase to pay for this. Now, you know, we, we uh, pass tax increases to pay for a variety of different things. I think many of us would say it would be well worth um, a small increase to address the cost of corruption. And in the long run, it might actually save us some money. Now, on that note, I think I've covered the different options. I think as we think about some of the values of what we need to do to address money in politics. I think it's always important to go back to voters and to think about, well, what is it that voters need? And we all need really good information. We need to be able to consider the source of information and to be able to engage in a conversation. Uh, and so uh, on that note, I will uh, hand it over to Sindra um, and we'll have questions, I guess. Oh, Mike, it looks like you have a question. And um, you, mentioned, Sandra, you mentioned that there are three states, Arizona, Maine, and I forget the third one, um, that are the public money elections. Connecticut. Uh, how is the program going? What is the process? What can I do? Um, I, I mean, I. The, the interesting thing is they're the ones that are being used as models when we're looking at different cities that are looking to do things. Berkeley just reenacted or just enacted a way to um, do some public financing, like she said, Seattle did. And they're really looking at those clean election programs as the model to get people to support ballot initiatives in those areas to do that. So I don't have um, I don't have numbers from their states directly to be able to tell you. Um, you know, what the impact is in those states, but it must be significant enough that these other, these other cities that want to do public financing are using them as models. So, um, sorry. <laughs> oh, you know, it, it did occur to me, so there are simple public financing models that some of us are comfortable with and that we are, have had here in Ohio in the past. So good public financing model would be the tax credit um, that, you know, that we had for many years where you get a $50 tax credit to give a campaign contribution. Well, if it's a tax credit, that means that the, the, that the state literally is not taking the money in. Um, and so it is, a form of it is a form of public financing of campaigns. And it is a more modest one, but it does encourage small donors. Um, Michael Malbin is somebody who did some research, he's down at Georgetown at the moment, has done some research that it increased small donors quite dramatically um, when it was first implemented. And then the other thing that's kind of interesting is um, Minnesota, for example, does it as a rebate. So it is clearly, you know, as opposed to the, the state not taking it in, you, you know, you make your check and you, you know, you, you, the candidate sends that information to the IRS with your information and they then send you a tax credit, so to speak, and you, you know, com comes on back to you. How is that not bribery? Yeah. 
mean, unfortunately, a lot of that bribery is not even happening through direct contributions to a candidate. It's happening through these independent expenditure only <coughs> committees. I mean, you have Bannon out there recruiting people in some of the more like Main Street Republican districts to get somebody that is considered to be on the Trump team to run against this Main Street Republican. Well, they're not doing that by giving dollars to that candidate's campaign directly. They're going mm -hmm. to fund large media campaigns where we have no idea who, who the players are. So unfortunately, in light of Citizens <coughs> United and then you know some of the subsequent cases, it's very little, I guess. So now what I would say is we can, um, it, it becomes complicated, but you can look at the lobbyist contributions, and sometimes that can help you understand, like who you know who is attempting to influence specific legislation. Um, so I've done it's been a m number of years, but I've done that thing where I've looked at the contributions that are, that occur directly to candidates and the lobbyists and the money at the same. T you know, so so you, looking at two different sources does not completely pull back the veil of what you're talking about, but does help to get at that. The other thing is, hopefully we all consider that kind of extortion bribery to be such a threat to democracy that people will actually stand up and say, hey, um, this occurred. This is a genuine problem. So, so, so uh, I was going to say she's the professor. So, in, so in in my mind, you know, um, voters do not necessarily live in a chocolate and vanilla world. Meaning, they don't necessarily live in a Democrat Republican world. And so, uh, the, one of the ways that they do measure this kind of thing is one to see whether there is more participation from people who would not have actually done this before. They would not actually have run for office. They would have said, oh, it'll be too hard to raise the money. I won't be able to get my message out. Um, they, so one of the ways to look at it is, is there more, partic is there more participation? And certainly, uh, so I live in the city of Columbus, um, and it is a city that at the moment all of the members of the city council are Democrats. Um, and there's a challenge, there's a challenge from um, the, the, of the establishment with the we can folks. And so one of the things that I think is that opportunity for those folks who haven't had a chance to get their message out successfully to really hear the difference between those folks that were appointed and then elected, and we have that system in, in Columbus, and folks that are thinking about things in a slightly different way. And it is a squishy metric. <coughs> I'm going for water, and Sindra can do this. I mean, I think another way to look at it is looking at, okay, in a lot of situations, you have one candidate who is accepting the public financing and the other candidate who's not. So it's really difficult because the one who is accepting uh, the matching funds or whatever whatever the type of public financing is, oftentimes, unfortunately, they're losing because they're going up against a candidate who is spending all of this money. It's why I think Romney didn't accept public financing in 2012 and why Trump didn't it, and, and, and Clinton didn't either. So, I mean, it, it's just one of those, I think the more we talk about it and create innovative ways to do it, like Seattle is doing, or, you know, like those states in Arizona and Connecticut and Maine, if we can come up with this clean election drive to do it so that you're showing a groundswelling of support enable, in, in, in order to even get on the ballot, um, I, I think that is, is a little bit better than, everybody's looking at this one behind me right now. <laughs> um, I, I think that that, that will become the way of measuring it as opposed to right now when all the data that we have is unfortunately favoring people that don't take the public funding. So I'm gonna throw out um, something a little crazy. Um, <laughs> you notice she got off the podium. <laughs> um, okay, so if our problem is that the candidates need to spend money on television and they need to spend you know, broadly on radio and digital, if we found better ways to get basic information about 
about who's running for office out to the voters, it could decrease the amount th that people actually have to spend. And of course, in this time period, this becomes really difficult. Like, who do you trust to share this information? Um, clearly, the League of Women Voters has a voter guide. Um, the, the state of California does a very comprehensive voter guide that, um, you know, it's 50 some pages often. It's more like a little, a little book. And I do think that there's something to be said for thinking about, is there a way we can do more vo voter, more voter education? Because otherwise, we're relying in many ways to educate, educate the public with, with what can best be described as slogans and just nonsense half the time. Well, unfortunately, there's a big problem with voter apathy as well. I mean, if we could get our, if we, if we could get our electorate to become more interested and engaged in the entire process, this conversation would be completely different. We instead, a lot of times, have candidates that are uh, just really, I, I, I don't know, capitalizing on the fact that so many people in the electorate don't pay attention. They're not sitting in rooms like this having educated conversations about how campaigns are funded and how we can access that information. Instead, they are waiting for the ads to show on the TV, and they're waiting for the mailers to come in the mailbox, and then they're gonna make you know, their decisions based on that information that all of this money is going to pay for. So, I mean, I think we need to have a, a whole conversation, not just about how they're funded, but how we get people more engaged in the process as well. Now, how many of you have actually given a contribution to a candidate? Raise your hand. We are not the norm, right? I mean, one, we're here talking the nuts and bolts of campaign finance on, on a, a, a lovely Thursday morning, um, but it's important to realize how many people do not participate in that kind of way. Um, there, Demos did this study called, they call it the color of money, and it really had to do with the fact that African Americans are not making contributions in the same kind of ways, um, and, and how does this how does this all play out? And are our people our, what does it mean to be active? And what's the importance of being a small donor um, versus being a large donor? What are the expectations of donors? Um, and so that's the other part of this piece of the puzzle. Like, what is it that donors are getting out of this? Do we want to get them to get what they're getting out of this? And how do we address it? And and maybe um, much like the speed limit. We're, we're nipping around the edges and dealing with the worst excesses, but heavens, you know, let's do that. Let's deal with some of the worst excesses. Hello in the back. So, so one of the things I would say, um, I'm, I'm certainly not the expert that Sindra is about, about you know, money and politics and that, this, all of the, the nuts and bolts, but one of the things that is interesting that we do differently than other countries that you all know, people are running for president now. So, uh, so it, we, it becomes a uniquely American problem because we do not have a campaign season. And we do not have a campaign season because we have First Amendment rights. We have the right to participate. We have the right to get the message out that we're running for office or not. Where are you, where are you John Kasich? Um, so as we, think about, as we think about one of the things that makes this uniquely an American problem, people are always running for office. And so there, some, some, of the, some of the reforms that we think about, like for example, let's say, um, no one can give to legislators while they're in session. Well, wait a second, we have a full-time legislature. Um, do we mean the days they're in session? Does that mean that they just have parties on Mondays and Fridays? You know, some of the things that make things particularly bad for us is that we just have elections all the time. Well, and another thing that makes Ohio unique, I mean, I talked about how outside of the states that have the unlimited contributions, we have the highest for folks that are running for the state house and for the state senate. Who's responsible for changing that? People that are in the state house and the state senate. So are they, are they just going to, you know, walk in one day and say, you know what, 
It's been really nice making almost $13,000 from each individual donor, but I think today, today we're going to change it to four hundred. I mean, who's going to do that? Any, I mean, yeah, they have term limits, so maybe if a great number of them are term li limited and not playing flip-flop with somebody in the other chamber, but I mean, I think it's going to take a really long time to get to that point in Ohio where mm -hmm. we decide this number might be too high or we're going to make it more difficult for us to run for office. It's, and then, you know, you look at this whole, do well, we do a ballot initiative by, it, do the citizens do a ballot initiative? Because in some of those states where they are doing public mm -hmm. financing, it was done via ballot mm -hmm. initiative. In some of those cities, it was done mm -hmm. via ballot initiative. Because the right group said, you know, hey, this isn't okay. We're, we're not doing this way anymore. Money needs to play less of a role. We need to hold these people more accountable. If we could pass term limits here in Ohio, maybe, maybe that is something we could pass. Maybe, you know. I mean, that's unfortunately the great problem that we're faced right now in light of Citizens United and McCutcheon in some of the court cases is, okay, put all these limits that you want to on money that's given on the books, but fine, I'm just, I, I wanted to donate 13000 to him, I'll give 400 here and I'll go give twelve six to the Independent Expenditure Only Committee. It, it's, yeah, I mean, that's just, but then yeah. it becomes, okay, you know, do people really care if they see at the end of a political advertisement that it was approved by the candidate versus, you know, paid for by, yeah, I don't think people care about it, but, but can we get to a point where maybe we are paying more attention to where that money's coming from? Mm -hmm. I think this election cycle is a little bit interesting with the issues. I mean, people really want to know where that money's coming from. Well, is there something that we can do on the heels of that after the election? Okay, well, we really wanted to know where that money was coming from. We really wanted to know which pharmaceutical companies were involved. Okay, well, do you really want to know who's funding, uh, you know, John Husted's Independent Expenditure Only Committee? Do you really want to know? Like, I don't know. I don't know if we can transition that really needing to know over to different. So, and I think you're absolutely right. We'd have to have good disclosure of the, you know, better disclosure of the independent expenditures, specifically the corporate dollars, and we would need very good coordination rules. Um, and 400 might be a little too low. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. Like, <laughs> I mean, that would be the other way to look at it. There were many years it was 2,500. It might be worth right. considering that. And looking at the immediate mm -hmm. disclosure too. Yeah, the national median is 3,800, so. Hello, my friend. So, so this is what I immediately jumped to, um, and it may not be where you were coming from. Um, I immediately jump to the six-year terms that judges have and that you want to have those terms be a little bit longer so there's a buffer between the last election. And so that's where I jump to. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily see the context of you might, uh, for, um, for other races, although I do think when you think about the two-year length of, like, that does seem like... They are always like, what, you know, how much do I need to raise every day? I, I, um, our, our members of Congress with just, you know, two years or our members of the Ohio House with just two years. It's got to be very difficult to keep up what is continually a brutal fundraising. And so this, is, this gets to thinking about, like, wait a second, what are some alternatives as opposed to thinking about how do you rein in the money? Well, maybe... De dealing with some le the length of terms. I've even wondered about lengthening judicial terms if we're going to continue to have judicial elections. Does it make sense to actually have a longer buffer for them? Um, and it could be the same kind of thing with members of Congress or members of the State House. What do you think? I, I mean, I, I think I just mm -hmm. would piggyback on what you say. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I feel like members of Congress would still always be running for office. I feel, I, I don't know, I think that's just the culture that we've created here. So I don't know that lengthening, 
I mean, if you looked at doubling it to what a member of the Senate, for example, there's a school, well, they're still always campaigning too. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, and in this day of like immediate, you want immediate gratification, immediate information, I, I think it makes it difficult to not always be running for office because we know exactly what everybody's doing at every moment and they have to be held accountable to that. So they're either gonna raise money off of it or hide from it. So, I mean, I, I think it just, I don't know that it plays that much of an impact. So any other questions? Hello. So, um, you know, I think that he identified some really specific things that in certain countries in Europe, people are simply not permitted to say. Um, some of that, of course, was a consequence of World War II. Um, I would think that, that if, if in fact, how can I put this? If in fact the difference between them and us has to do with free speech, and I was talking about free speech, you can run for office you know, anytime you want, you can, you know, it's your right to talk whenever, where they limit things, that is, that is a significant difference. I do think, and, and so I picked a bunch of political cartoons because I thought it would be kind of fun and gives you something all to look at. Um, but I think that when I put them together and I started thinking, thinking about, about them, free speech isn't really free, is it? And so I think that's the other thing that we continue to struggle with. What does it mean? And we know in the public arena, like I started off talking about, there's a limitation on when you can talk in a public hearing or um, you can't you know, scream the Bill of Rights at the top of your lungs at two in the morning. I mean, so we have some limits in the public square um, on this and what, whenever we do do limits of any type, we need to be really clear about why we're doing it. And I genuinely understand the people that are like, just let it rip because it can be really scary about the, the idea of limiting things. So um, one of the conversations they were having about the Susan B. Anthony case had to do with um, the election, saying the election commission you know, couldn't actually come down on whether this was truthful or not truthful. And I have to tell you, I've always felt squeamish about the government, these people that were appointed by the governor deciding what was true. That always made me really squeamish. The problem is we have not come up with a good way to suss out a type of truth. And whether that is some type of fact check that involves multiple organizations all saying, well, you know, I believe this because of X, Y, and D, and they give f facts and information. Um, I, you know, I think there, there are some models that we could think of based on newspapers doing it, but sometimes what you really want is you want to hear from the different types of people about how they look at an ad or how they think about things. And it would be wonderful to have a place where you could just go and hear from different people about why they thought an ad was truthful or not truthful. Um, because the government deciding that something is truthful is genuinely problematic. Hello, A in the back, peanut gallery. It seems to me that part of the issue that we're struggling with is how to uh, acknowledge that the individual voter ought to be at the top of the heap. It was captured mm -hmm. in one of your cartoons, mm -hmm. uh, Evolution for the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. you know, which shows life forms evolving out of the mm -hmm. sea human beings and then corporations being the mm -hmm. highest form of, of life as evolution mm -hmm. proceeds. And also in many of the other cartoons about the weight of money mm -hmm. um, and so forth. And it, it, there are two issues that have troubled me throughout this morning's discussion. Mm -hmm. One is that although ultimately, yes, each person's vote counts for one, whether you're a multi-billionaire or you're a poor homeless person, each vote counts equally in the uh, voting booth. Mm -hmm. The reality being, though, that voting participation varies <coughs> dramatically mm -hmm. and is colored by the perception when so much wealthy money gives so many overwhelming messages the size of the megaphones in many of the cartoons. Mm -hmm. Individual voters are discouraged from even voting. In other words, there seems to be no point in even voting. The fix is in. Money is spoken, the powerful people are in charge, and so on and so forth. So there is a problem 
in terms of individual contributions and the untrammeled effect of money from individuals. But the even bigger problem, it seems to me, is the underlying assumption, and we assume it almost, that corporations are like people. They're simply the next evolution of human beings. But wait a minute, there's a discontinuity there. There's a disconnect. And we haven't talked very much about the whole notion of corporate personhood, although it underlies all of this. Why should corporations be allowed to donate money at all? It seems to me there's a line we can draw and say, no, corporate, as the senator said, corporations can be prohibited in certain states, and they could be prohibited universally from acting as if they're actors in the political debate. Is there a question here? Okay, so anybody who would like to talk to Move to Amend or about corporate personhood, please join this gentleman back here in, um, and have a good visit. Um, and I do realize that what we, t we were talking about some things that we believe are attainable. Yes, every once in a while I say, well, what about this idea? But the, the, the reforms and the things that we talked about now in the, with the current Supreme Court that we have without actually amending the U.S. Constitution, these are some very practical things that we can do. Thank you all for staying and coming and um, have a good afternoon.